My name is Corey Enk. I am the Vice President of Lead Technical Development at USGBC, and I'm joined by Sarah Talkington and Christian Cianfron. Um, they will be providing some context uh, behind the energy credits within LEED, and more importantly, talking about the evolution of the LEED rating system and how we'll be addressing energy and climate change in the future. Uh, so quickly, uh, Sarah is the Green Building Commercial Manager at Austin Energy uh, in Texas. She was a core member of the EA TAG from 2013 to 2017, and she currently sits on our technical committee. Christian is a principal at Morrison Hirschfield in British Columbia, um, where he leads the building performance analysis group, uh, and he's currently the chair of the EA TAG. Here are our learning objectives, and I will turn it over to Christian. Thanks, Corey. Morning, everyone. How many folks from the West Coast here in the crowd? Okay, you have my sympathy this morning. Everybody else, not that early. Um, thought it'd be appropriate to quote a Canadian scientist. Um, let you guys just take a quick read here, and I'll move on. I'm going to mainly focus on energy performance, uh, you know, the, the one credit but the very uh, points-heavy credit in lead. Uh, kind of tell you where, where we've come from, kind of where we're headed. Uh, a lot of the impetus for this conversation today, uh, who's seen this blog post by Greg Katz a couple weeks ago? Okay, only a few of you. I'll let you just read the, the headline there. It says, lead must be updated to address climate change. If LEED does not incorporate deep CO2 reductions as a requirement, it will fail its most important test of leadership. So a pretty uh, compelling article and sort of challenging um, us through the LEED rating system to do more on carbon. So I'm going to kind of take a step back, see how we've come from, how we're evolving in terms of addressing climate change uh, and where we think we're heading in the future. The backdrop for this is, of course, um, what's happening to our planet. Uh, here is just the, the fundamentals of the Paris Agreement, which the goals are primarily to uh, hold increasing global temperatures to two, um, but focus on limiting that to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that's sort of the main, the main points of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to limit those temperatures. Unfortunately, the graph on the right kind of shows, oh, sorry, kind of shows um, our progress. The, the high emissions trend is here, whereas we don't want to be. So this is kind of our baseline. All the commitments from Paris kind of take us here, and then we need to be on this lower line over here. So even with Paris, we're still probably going to fall short um, of our target. So this is setting up the context that, yes, absolutely, we need to address climate change. Um, there's no question uh, carbon is the reason for climate change, and we need to do even more uh, to come up to, to address that challenge. And put simply in another way, there are just over four years worth of current emissions left before it becomes unlikely that we meet that 1.5 degrees Celsius target that we're after. Okay, so a lot of work to do, uh, and we need to do it fast. So as I said, it's sort of indisputable that, that carbon is the driver for climate change, so we need to do more, we need to raise the bar. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just talk really briefly now, and I think Corey will touch on it as well, and kind of what, what we're, we're doing um, through lead technical committees and through, with staff at C, uh, USGBC uh, in terms of raising the bar. I think um, many of you will know that for lead 2009 and the older rating system, products that are still in that pipeline have had to increase their performance uh, recently with a minimum of four energy points instead of just the uh, previous prerequisite uh, minimum requirement. And there's evolutions uh, likely to come for lead version four that will also uh, focus on raising the bar. But in terms of uh, focusing on climate change and carbon, you know, how has uh, lead done to date? How are we adapting? Um, and why are buildings so important? And if you look at this graph, you know, buildings here between buildings themselves and uh, electricity and heat production that's predominantly for buildings, we're looking at over 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions attributed to buildings. So there's lots to do, and our industry has a big role to play in those reductions. So I'm going to start here. Um, I got a few graphs. I'm an engineer. I can't help it. Uh, so there's um, a little bit of data to look at here. 
Of course, ASHRAE 90.1 is the standard. It's the baseline for which all of the lead performance, uh, energy performance um, points are awarded. And it's based on this metric of energy cost. Okay, always has been. Uh, it's what we know, how we measure our percent in improvement, our relative performance over code is this energy cost metric. And so what this plots is over the last about 30 years starting, this is just from data from 2011 back 30 years, it shows the average cost uh, in the same units of electricity on a national average and of natural gas on a national average, which are the two predominant fuel types uh, that we see in most of the buildings across North America. And the difference in cost is about an average of three to one. So electricity costs about three times more than natural gas on average. And this is suspiciously coincidental with um, the historical and current source to site ratio for energy is three to one. So how much energy is uh, required upstream to produce uh, one unit of energy downstream from the electricity grid. And it's also uh, suspiciously um, coincidental that the average national electrical grid emissions factor is about three times higher than site natural gas. So this three to one number comes up a lot and really what I'm trying to say here is that energy cost historically has been a pretty darn good proxy for CO2, for greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so while we might think that we're not measuring carbon directly, the cost metric has, I think, served us well generally when we look at a standard that has been set up as a national or international standard um, and when we look at numbers and metrics on average throughout the country. But times are changing and we need to adapt. And so the way we understand how greenhouse gas emissions um, are distributed throughout the country is evolving. Uh, if those familiar with Portfolio Manager, um, it uses a methodology for accounting for greenhouse gas emissions that is geographically based. So the emissions associated with electrical grids uh, is that differs by these, what they call these E-grids, these regional grid emissions factors. And these are the E-grids in the U.S. I don't label them where they're from, but this is basically the distribution. And you can see that the cleanest, what I'll call the, I'll use the word clean and dirty grid, uh, the cleanest grid and the dirtiest grid have a factor of about five to one. Okay, and if you look at just some example costs of those grids, uh, a dirtier grid could be really cheap, so eight cents a kilowatt hour in electricity and a clean grid could be really expensive, twice the cost. Okay, so what does that mean? It's, it's starting to mean as we get more granular in understanding about how, where GHG emissions are coming from and how they're regionally distributed, um, cost is starting to show up as not being the greatest measure of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so I think historically a national average, it's done pretty well for us. As we move forward and we understand things better, it's starting to deviate from cost and greenhouse gas emissions as being linked. Um, in Canada, it's actually even more uh, uh, disparate. Here we have a factor of 560 between our cleanest regional grid and our dirtiest regional grid, uh, predominantly in a, in a province that has 100%, um, almost 100% hydro versus one that's almost based on 100% uh, coal-powered electricity. Okay, so how does this play out in, in real projects? So if we just take a, a one scenario of a building um, and we look at that building if it were located in different geographic regions uh, and we look at sort of a, a typical energy savings of a project of about 25 percent. This axis here shows us uh, relative greenhouse gas emissions savings and relative uh, energy cost savings, which is the metric we're most familiar with. And so if we're located in a dirty grid and we're mostly saving a lot of gas or a lot of heating energy, you know, where I'm from, we're a heating dominated climate um, out here in Boston, same thing uh, holds true. And so if we're saving most of our heat and in natural gas, most of our energy in natural gas, but we're located in a grid that has a high carbon emissions factor, we're actually not doing very well in relative carbon savings. 25% savings in energy only gets us about 10% relative carbon reductions and about 10% relative cost reductions. In that same grid, if we're going to focus on electrical savings, sort of the high carbon fuel source of the high carbon utility, then those same energy savings actually have a much higher relative uh, GHG reductions, up at 40%. And actually the costs do really well. So costs are a really good proxy in these dirty grid scenarios for uh, greenhouse gas reductions. Okay, but if we look at the risk of, um, of some of these metrics, 
in a cleaner grid, if we're saving lots of gas, that's a good thing because the relative carbon savings here is actually quite high when we're saving on the high carbon fuel. Again, if we're located in a clean grid and we're trying to reduce carbon emissions, we're going to focus on the high carbon fuel. Um, and, like, and similarly, or uh, in that clean grid, if we're saving electrical savings, we might be saving a lot of cost, but we're not necessarily saving a lot of carbon because we're saving on the low carbon uh, utility. Okay, so what does all this mean? Well, it's, it says a couple of things. It says if we're not measuring the right metric, we may not be getting the outcomes we want. Okay, so it's sort of supporting um, what Greg was saying in his blog post that uh, there was a lot of commentary on the last couple of weeks, which is uh, maybe not, choose, not having the right metric out there may not incentivize us to be reducing where we need to. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at this extreme here, if we're in a clean grid scenario and we just electrify everything and you know, wash our hands clean and say the building can do whatever it wants, we're just going to be connected to clean power, uh, we could have potentially 100% greenhouse gas emissions reductions, but we might have 40 to 50% increase in operating costs. So if we only focused on carbon, how do we pay for, how do we pay for those carbon reductions? Okay. The reason, um, or the good news about when we have metrics that align, where we have something like energy cost savings aligning with carbon reductions, that's a really good news story because it means that owners, developers who are uh, developing buildings and building buildings, um, they can pay for those carbon reductions because they're also getting those energy cost savings. So um, we have to look at all these metrics uh, and see what advantages they bring and what disadvantages they bring. So this just says it in another way, uh, depending on the grid, um, you know, your electrical costs can be three quarters or more of the overall utility costs. Um, but if you're based in a dirty grid, uh, you know, that three quarters of the cost aligns well with carbon, so you have an incentive to reduce the, the highest greenhouse gas emissions of that building. Um, in a clean grid, you might have three quarters of the cost all bottled up in this really low carbon area, and so you may not be incentivized as much to reduce carbon um, uh, in, the, in this uh, fossil fuel-based um, GHG emissions. Okay, so who's going to pay for the carbon reductions? Uh, focusing on carbon alone may not be a good driver when we also need to make sure we can pay for those carbon reductions. So what we've done um, through this pilot credit, I uh, hope many of you have looked at this on your projects. It's the alternative energy performance metric. Uh, it allows folks to choose um, other metrics other than energy cost. And it's a way for the USGBC and, and the technical committees to look at some of the data. What are other important metrics that people are using on projects? Um, how, are they, how are buildings performing when we look at them through a different lens other than energy cost? And how do those metrics relate to each other? So there's, uh, the pilot credit has been recently updated um, to be a bit more flexible. It now only requires that at least two of these metrics be calculated, not all four. And you average the two highest metrics to determine your lead points, which means that you're blending multiple metrics and not just focusing on one. And the four are your energy costs, which we're used to, uh, energy sources, which could be primary energy or source energy. Uh, there's a couple of methodologies there. Greenhouse gas emissions, um, using the portfolio manager uh, approach, and then um, what's popular for California, which is time-dependent valuation. Okay, so this is, um, sorry, this is an introduction of how we're trying to explore what it means to look at other metrics in lead. We're starting to collect that data. There's been a, a a significant uptake in this pilot credit over the last few months, and we're hoping that more project teams will uh, partake in it. If we can collect the data and see how we can use that to move forward and understand how these metrics support our, our outcomes and our objectives. So I'm also going to just switch gears a little bit here and just talk about um, the case for other metrics. And uh, while, while carbon's important, we have to live in buildings that are comfortable, resilient, and that we want to spend time in. And so here's a, just going to show a snapshot of some of the work um, that we've been doing in Canada related to some of the policy developments there that, that look at a range of metrics. And here we have an all glass tower, and this is the uh, Passive House Student Residence at uh, Cornell University in New York City. And this graph is in degrees Celsius, my apologies. Um, and what it shows here is in a cold snap in the winter, and this, the climate for this graph is actually in uh, Toronto, which is very similar to Boston. Uh, what happens when the power goes out in a two-week cold snap in the winter is that an all-glass tower would have a significant rapid decline in interior temperature, meaning that the spaces become inhabitable um, 
when we lose power, which is becoming more and more com common. In Toronto in 2013, there was an ice storm, there was blackout in some parts of the city for over two weeks, and it was extremely cold over that period. And we're starting to see some of that, uh, those things happen more frequently. Up here is uh, the decline in temperature for a building that, was, that had met a passive house standard. So it barely drops a couple degrees over two weeks um, because it's able to retain that heat. So that building is livable. People can uh, go somewhere in, in uh, events of blackouts. Uh, they can stay in their homes. And so these buildings are much more comfortable in general and they're much more resilient when these events happen. So uh, carbon wouldn't... Something like carbon or energy costs may not get at, uh, at building buildings with those kind of features, right? So we have to start looking at what else, how else do we do measure buildings to make sure that they, they give us what we need out of them. So just a, a brief um, introduction. Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance is a group of cities that have committed to between 80 and 100 percent of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, so pretty lofty goals. Uh, one of the, two of those cities, um, and I'm just showing a couple examples here, I'll start on the right. This is the City of Toronto, and the City of Vancouver has done something similar, which is developed the Zero Emissions Building Framework, which is a new uh, energy code-like policy in the city. And what it does is it measures, uh, it requires maximum levels of uh, energy, carbon, and thermal energy use. So it actually uses three metrics to make sure buildings are performing well. One of the things about uh, both Toronto and Vancouver is they are cities that have very clean grids, um, the, uh, the regions or provinces have very clean grids. And so to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, all those buildings have to do is electrify. And they would have massive greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, but what happens with uh, grid reliability or grid capacity or load profiles? Um, so in order to address the building itself, not only do, do these policies have greenhouse gas emissions reductions, they also have maximum allowable energy use intensity and also maximum allowable thermal energy intensity which means that they have to minimize their heating load at least to a certain amount, uh, requiring these buildings to have a minimum level of building envelope performance so that they can be comfortable and perform well over time. Um, and so these are various standards that are starting to look at stuff at greenhouse gas emissions directly, but also other metrics that are important uh, to the outcome of these buildings. And so uh, just a plug for the Canada Green Building Council up north, they just developed a zero carbon building standard. Again, it's got two met metrics. One is you have to have zero, a net zero carbon, and the other one is uh, minimizing what they call thermal energy demand intensity, again, which is a representation of the heating load, meaning that these buildings not only have to reduce carbon, but also have to perform well by having a uh, high performance building envelope so that they can be resilient uh, in, in certain situations. So this is a snapshot of, um, you know, every jurisdiction is different and the, on, from the lead perspective, uh, you know, what works well in terms of metric or metrics or blended metrics is something that's being considered as we evolve uh, the lead metric on energy performance. Um, this is an example of five different jurisdictions that have focused on greenhouse gas emissions and you'll notice that um, in addition to this greenhouse gas emissions target, there's typically two other metrics that have been uh, incorporated into these standards because what we're starting to find is that in order to get everything we want out of buildings, in addition to climate change, we need to start measuring more than one thing. Um, you know, and some of these have maximum energy use intensity targets, some of them have a percent better than code requirement, and so it just varies by jurisdiction for what works. And so these are some of the metrics that, uh, you know, we're going to be exploring and trying to figure out what makes sense as an international standard um, to be able to make sure we achieve our objectives around climate change and high building performance. Uh, and so just in summary here, I think we're all in agreement, drastic carbon reductions are necessary uh, in buildings, and LEED is raising the bar in that regard. Uh, as I said, we've raised the bar from the old version of LEED in 2009 for products still in the pipeline, and we're looking at raising the bar for LEED before through 4.1, which Corey will touch on briefly. Uh, we should probably start measuring carbon at, at to some degree um, and not lead directly, but um, Corey and we'll talk about ARC and, and ARC starting to look at carbon as a metric. And then, you know, my, my opinion is that we can't just look at one metric to make sure we have cost-effective livable buildings in the future and we probably need to start considering uh, multiple metrics. And I'll leave you with this picture. This is the USGBC offices in, in D.C. And again, we have these spaces that need to be comfortable, resilient, um, uh, people have to live and work in them, and so while carbon's important, we have to ensure that we're also meeting all our other objectives uh, for our sustainable uh, 
um, to meet our sustainable buildings goals. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Talkington. I work for Austin Energy. It's a municipally owned utility uh, at the city of Austin. And um, asked to put a quote together that really uh, captured the way in which I feel about my work. I thought a 13th century mystic poet, uh, Rumi, really captured my ideals. It's let the beauty we love be what we do. That said, I'm a Gemini. So um, I put together another quote that says, all right, nerds, let's do this. <laughs> and that's um, really because the time is now and this is urgent as um, Christian outlined. So I'm here today to talk to you specifically about scaling energy. Um, I think that one of the most interesting and compelling things that LEED version 4 does is take into consideration a larger energy um, experience. It takes into consideration the entire uh, ecosystem of energy. Um, when LEED v4 was updated, there were two guiding principles. That was this rating needs to progress. It needs to become... Um, stronger and more in this direction towards our goal. It also needs to be simplified so that some of the um, uh, criteria put in place don't get in the way of achieving those really important goals. So those are kind of the themes that I'll be returning to throughout the rest of my presentation. So to give you a context of what I mean by an energy ecosystem, I thought that this uh, image that astronaut, uh, a Canadian astronaut, uh, Chris Hadfield, took from space really captures what I'm going for. This is um, an image of Berlin at night. And 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you can still really see the difference between East and West Berlin. On the East, you've got that warm, dim gas light. And on the West, you've got um, really bright commercial corridors that are lit up and really uh, all about the um, brightness and vibrancy on that side. Um, so this is all juxtaposed to this concept that the utility industry is really changing right now. We've got the Internet of Things, we've got um, nanotechnology, we've got uh, big data, and while all of those things are very much happening right now, we still have the context and the history and the ability to change and the desire to change, which are, um, I guess, balancing each other continually. So um, I'd like to discuss three areas specifically where the cert certifications changed to recently adapt and respond to the complexity of the ecosystems all of the buildings we work on operate within. So um, these changes are in three primary areas. They are the way in which the ratings address renewables, two, the inclusion of demand response, and three, the new peer or performance excellence in electricity renewal. That really rolls off the tongue. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a new certification system by the USGBC. Um, how many people in the audience are familiar with PEER? Okay, I think that um, there's a lot of opportunity there, and I'll go into it a little bit later in my slides. So um, I'm going to focus on the renewables uh, concept first. Lead renewable energy and green energy credits were simplified to encourage more renewable energy installation and progressed to recognize the cost of renewables has come down significantly. There are three major shifts within the concept of renewables I'll draw your attention to. These are one, uh, in version four, the renewable energy production definition. Um, how they define on site is relaxed. I'll go into that more a little bit later. Um, there's a new EA pilot credit for allowing other people to put solar on your roof. And three, there's a natural progression in the terms for green power. Okay, so um, jumping back out to that energy ecosystem co concept, um, 
The requirements for the renewables credit and V4 were loosened to recognize some urban energy ecosystems characteristics. Downtown, you've got these really tall, skinny buildings. Um, these are also um, some of the highest uh, dollars per square foot um, buildings that any city will have. So that means these people tend to have a huge passion and budget for things like green power. That said, um, tall, skinny buildings are rarely a good candidate for solar. They don't really have the roof space, and if they did have the roof space, it would probably be shaded by a next-door neighbor. But that's only um, one of the limitations. There's another one. Um, so most downtown networks are on a mesh network. And a mesh network is a way that utilities handle um, complex energy ecosystems such as this one. They're non-hierarchical grids where each one of these buildings is a different node. And energy can be routed through them any number of ways. So it, there's no um, linear progression. It's all um, a mesh network. And the reason why um, utilities like this is because it's resilient, it's self-healing. Um, if one building goes down, another uh, can just root around it. And uh, it's great in a lot of ways. That said, mesh networks are not at all handled, uh, are not at all intended to handle any back feed. So um, at no point can energy go back onto that grid. So that means that um, any solar panels in a downtown network can never exceed the base load of a building, which is a major limitation towards our goals of net zero. So these downtown projects are ideal candidates for community solar. Um, so community solar is a relatively new product that um, I don't know how many people are familiar with yet, so I'll define it. It's um, it's generally a large-scale solar array that leverages an economy of scale. Um, it can utilize land that could otherwise go unused for some reason, like it's in a floodplain or it's in an easement. Um, and it is typically built by a utility and then sold or leased off in chunks as though these were solar panels on your roof. It's a great candidate, again, for downtown customers, but it's also a great candidate for people who um, otherwise don't own their roof. So say you're a renter or you live in a condo. Um, also, if you just live in a house and have uh, lots of trees shading your roof or uh, if you have a poor orientation, these are all great candidates for community solar. So LEED V4 allows for these matches to be made where a downtown project can get their renewable energy credits through a community solar project. As long as that uh, solar array is in your service territory and as long as your contract to lease or own that array is for at least 10 years. Um, there's also a pilot credit uh, for leasing your roof space to other people. So say you are a, um, a storage facility and you have a very low load, but you've got a huge roof. It's a great um, opportunity to say, I've got plenty of roof space. Why don't you install your solar here? And I get a point for it as the storage facility, which is um, a great opportunity. So as a city employee in Texas, we recently experienced some uh, major power outages associated with the hurricanes. And one of the things that um, I started to think about is how community solar could be a great match with resilient community centers. We could create these scenarios where community centers could be established, um, they could be islanded, and they could provide access to critical needs such as charging cell phones, filtering drinking water, and keeping food and medical supplies safe. So um, if anybody else works in a city or is concerned with resiliency, I'd just like to point out um, this is a huge opportunity that could now be rewarded in um, all sorts of ways. So that last point in the renewables concept that I wanted to address was green power. Um, LEED V4 requirements for green 
power are just a natural progression from where we were in 2009. In 2009, we were asking for 35% and 70%. In V4, they're asking for 50% and 100%. The terms have also gone up. It went from two years to five years. And that is because, um, frankly, green power remains to be an inexpensive alternative and one that there are very few limitations to pursuing any project could go for that. So, um, I think it's exciting that LEED recognizes through additional flexibility and removal of barriers, there is value in greening the grid at every scale, at the building, at the utility, at the energy market, within a country, et cetera. The goal is deployment of more renewables. So um, it's long been recognized that perhaps the best place for our solar panels is space. We just need to be working out perhaps the um, wireless transmission of energy. So hopefully some of you are working on that here today. And um, just another point that it's kind of silly to be hung up on these concepts of on-site. All right, so speaking of challenges, green power does come with some challenges that it would be remiss of me as a utility employee to not explain. Um, for me, I'm an engineer and I'm pretty mechanical, so if somebody explains to me um, the challenges associated with something in a mechanical way, it's something that will stick with me. So I think we're all familiar with the fact that um, people just say, like, utilities don't like solar or solar's difficult. <laughs> um, so I'd like to explain a little bit more about the physical limitations of solar. So basically all of the other um, ways in which electricity is generated is rotational energy and it has inertia and momentum. So you literally get wheels spinning, and when a wheel is about to spin, it starts to spin, and it sends that, um, it takes additional energy to get going, and when it stops spinning, it's not um, sudden, or um, you basically keep wheels going um, with the inertia of having it started. So basically, um, in the U.S., our grid is at 60 hertz. Uh, Canada, the rest of the world, you're at 50 hertz. But you can literally spin wheels faster or slower to match that frequency and to get things all um, going together. It's an alternating current, rotational energy, beautiful way in which things work. And solar kind of messes all of that up. <laughs> it just shows up, leaves, doesn't text when it's coming, doesn't text when it's leaving. It's pretty rude. So um, it takes some uh, serious adaptation for utilities who are, um, like I said, kind of stuck in that status quo. We really like our momentum and inertia <laughs> to adjust to this new paradigm. So solar, that is the guy, the purple guy on this graph. You can see, um, so th I'm from Texas, and uh, I think that's worth pointing out that our load shapes are perhaps different than many of the people in the room, and for sure different than Canada's and Boston's, and that we're concerned with um, late afternoon peak. Uh, that blue line on this graph is what our peak uh, load demand looks like. And all of these other lines, uh, so the green, the blue, and the red, those are all wind energy in Texas. And so we have tons of land out there in West Texas where we've put all of this wind, and it's an awesome thing to behold. Um, but it can be stranded out there because basically all of our city centers are in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and to get that energy out there from West Texas to those centers, city centers, we've had to build a lot of transmission lines. That solar can be, I mean, sorry, that wind can become stranded out there. And actually, we experience negative prices in Texas somewhat regularly over the summer at night when we have so much wind on our grid and an inability to frankly use it or get it to our city centers. 
Um, so we started deploying coastal wind, which is this red um, line, and that is because it does a better job of coinciding with our peak, that blue bar, um, and kind of filling the gap between where the solar lets off and the other wind picks up. Um, but you can see, like right there where the purple and the red line up, you've got a dip which is a great segue to my next concept, which is demand response. Um, so I'll just put this out there. I love demand response. <laughs> um, I think most of you who work in buildings hate it, and it's super confusing for me. So my mission for the next five to seven minutes is to convince you of the charms of demand response. <laughs> um, so it is an opportunity for customers to play a significant role in the energy market. It's usually incented through time of use rates or other financial incentives. And there's two points in lead version four for these demand response points. And okay, so one of the reasons why demand response has a huge amount of opportunity in uh, the ERCOT market, which, um, you know, there's the East Coast, there's the West Coast, and then there's Texas. And Texas is basically the ERCOT market. It's um, a super fun market to play in because it's relatively contained um, and we can do some more experimental things without taking down um, people like New York <laughs> who might uh, be fussier about it <laughs> than Texans. But um, there's a lot of potential, basically, in the ERCOT market with demand response. We have 10 gigawatts of capacity that is used less than 5% of the hours. So these are um, 10 gigawatts of um, power plants that sit staffed, secured, ready to go at any moment, um, that are only used 5% of the hours in a year. And these are typically dirtier um, gas power plants. If they um, were cleaner, they would be used the other 95% of the time. But all of this is to say that any load that we can reduce during these 5% of those hours has an enormous benefit to the grid. It keeps prices down for everyone, and I think more importantly, it prevents uh, new power plants from needing to be built, which is what I will demonstrate in this slide. Um, demand response is one of our best options for delaying the need to construct new power plants until we can bring costs down for greener forms of energy. So this graph is the past 50 years in the ERCOT market. And you can see that the bulk of our coal fleet was installed before 1990. Wind capacity has been the dominant uh, technology that's been deployed since 2006. And finally, natural gas had a share high point of 48% in 2015, and then in 2016, it declined for the first time ever, down to 44%. So all of this is to say, um, we can be enormously proud of our work. We are delaying the need to build new power plants, and they are progressing to more uh, green forms of energy. And, um, I think that we should recognize that if we can do this in Texas, where the political climate is what it is, um, it has to make financial sense, and it is. The money is playing out. So um, this is an enormous, like, yes, <laughs> we're winning, even in Texas. Um, so another potential utility benefit for demand response is the ability to avoid price spikes. Uh, the ERCOT market uh, prices average 22 to 23 hours a megawatt hour, and that can increase up to $9,000 a megawatt hour at any increment of time. Um, it's very rare, but uh, so this basically shows the number of hours it's happened over the past uh, 2014, 2015, 2016. Um, but there's an enormous opportunity here in terms of uh, capturing those savings when the prices do spike. 
That said, here's what one of those price spikes looks like. It uh, happens very quickly and kind of comes out of nowhere. So you have to be pretty well poised to capture such a thing. And here's the type of system <laughs> that you'd need to have in place in order to do that. Um, basically, you're going to need a utility management system that can send signals about prices. You're going to need to have meters in place that are recognizing your load at any moment. And customer infrastructure, whether it's your building management systems, your thermostats, your um, appliances, your electric car, that can respond to those signals that are coming and um, basically uh, stop charging or cycle off, that sort of thing. And right now, a ton of research and work is going into the deployment of all of this communication. Um, the standards, the protocols, we're working out uh, what you can imagine is a very complex problem with lots of different um, players. And we can thank some of the mass, uh, major disasters for moving this work forward, frankly. Um, Superstorm Sandy, some nuclear power outages in uh, California. You have to take the good with the bad. And while all of that is happening, and it will take some time, there are some really low-tech ways in which demand response is being monetized to save money for utility customers. So. In today's day and age, this is probably the way in which you would be participating in a demand response program. Um, the transmission costs in Texas are allocated um, based on four coincidental peaks each summer. There's one in June, July, August, and September. And there's these moments in time, each one of those months, and you don't know when it happened until after it happened, where they recognize that was the peak and then calculate all of the transmission costs for the year based on your load on the grid during that time frame. Um, and if you happen to be able to reduce your load in any sizable way during any one of those 15-minute increments <laughs> during those four coincidental peaks, you can save your utility millions of dollars. So right now, what we tend to have is some very small, scrappy teams at utilities who are spending a lot of time trying to figure out precisely when those peaks are going to happen any summer. It's extremely fun work. It's also very challenging. Um, I can say while uh, I did this work at Austin Energy, we were literally had binoculars out looking at clouds, being like, do you think that's going to go over downtown? Because <laughs> if so, like, we've ruined everything. Um, sometimes there um, would be a situation where you would reduce your load because today was the peak and you were super confident about it, but you accidentally re reduced the load so, uh, so well <laughs> that you um, turned a different day in the, into the peak. <laughs> so basically, we've got all of these utilities in Texas trying to figure this all out, and it's uh, fun, and I encourage you all to participate. <laughs> um, we had some really uh, s savvy customers participating in all sorts of ways. Um, one of my favorites was a beer distributor, and he basically pre-cooled uh, all of his kegs and then just floated through responses. <laughs> and uh, I liked imagining him on those days. <laughs> okay, so the last thing I want to touch on today is USGBC's, uh, or GBCI's new rating system, PEER, and the role that it can now play in your projects um, and their lead certifications. For those of you who aren't familiar, again, PEER is a rating system that can be used to evaluate power generation, transmission, and distribution. And uh, there's a new pilot credit that enables a project that's attached to a district energy system to take a credit, basically, for the efficiencies upstream of the building in these district energy systems. And this can really streamline the rating process for campuses where district energy systems are used. And more importantly, perhaps, I think this pilot credit is a harbinger of the 
additional coordination that's to come from uh, LEAD and the USGBC to uh, coordinate across scales and really facilitate this type of um, changes within the ecosystem across all of the different uh, players. And that's it. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm going to take a step back really quick and talk about some of the initiatives at USGBC and programs that, uh, that do focus on energy. And first, I wanted to talk about system goals. How many of you are familiar with USGBC's system goals? OK, a few. Um, so these are, really, these are really the values behind the LEED rating system. These are, these are the things that LEED cares about. So in, in version 4, we develop these. Um, these are positively phrased, so these are things that we want buildings to be doing better at. Um, climate change, human health, water, uh, ecosystem services, material cycles, building a green economy, and enhancing community quality of life. Um, we spend a lot of time within our committees prioritizing these system goals as well. Um, it took about a year, uh, and this is how we prioritize them. So you'll see that climate change is far and away number one. So that is far and away the biggest priority that the LEED rating system is addressing. Uh, human health is next, followed by water, et cetera. Uh, so what we did with this then was to take this prioritization, uh, associate all of these system goals uh, with all of our credits in the LEED rating system, uh, determine how each credit addresses each of these seven system goals, put that all in a big spreadsheet, and then weight our rating system compare them relative to each other, and then use that to distribute points. Uh, so all of this is to say, that's why the energy section within LEED is worth so many points. So it's still almost a third, just over a third of the points within LEED are focused on energy. So that is the thing we care about uh, within LEED, in addition to many other things. Uh, so another thing that uh, I wanted to touch on uh, is ARC. Uh, so ARC is a new initiative within USGBC. Um, that is helping to also address energy and climate change. Um, ARC is a platform for tracking and scoring uh, building performance across five categories, uh, one of which is energy. Uh, the goal here is really to get the right information into the building owner's hands so that they can start to operate the buildings better and use that, those analytics to report out on building performance for various uh, third-party frameworks. Uh, so we're excited to see how ARC is developing. Um, the energy score within ARC uh, is based on greenhouse gas emissions, as Christian mentioned. So we are looking at the total energy use of the building, uh, also the occupancy and the size of that building, translating that to greenhouse gas emissions, and then scoring that relative to a data set and a reference set. So. The energy score is based on a, sc uh, a score from 0 to 33, again, uh, mirroring the weightings within the lead rating system. Um, you do have to provide 12 months of energy data, uh, and more importantly, it does give you analytics. It does compare your score uh, relative to local and global benchmarks. Uh, so lastly, I did want to talk about lead version 4.1. So we did announce yesterday that we will be launching uh, LEED version 4.1, which is an update to LEED version 4, uh, early next year. So the, our committees are currently working on it right now. Um, one of the uh, important things to, to note about LEED version 4 is that it has been out in the market for four years. We launched it back in 2013. Um, we started development on LEED version 4 back in 2009. So back then, when we were setting our energy targets uh, to ASHRAE 90.1 uh, 2010, uh, a 5% improvement over that seemed, uh, seemed appropriate for the market. Uh, I think as we've, um, as we've evolved, we've realized that that target has become easier for the market. So with LEED version 4, this really gives us an opportunity to re-examine all of those energy credits and, and make sure that, that LEED is staying relevant. Um, we want to make sure that the market hasn't caught up with us, and we want to continue driving that transformation. Because ultimately, USGBC's goal is market transformation, and we do want LEED to remain uh, that relevant and that global leader in, in green building. 
Uh, so thank you. We have time for uh, a few questions, uh, five minutes or so. So if you do have a question, please go to the, uh, to the microphone in the middle. I have a question for Christian. Um, you showed how the uh, electric grid is more uh, intense in greenhouse gas emissions. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. I don't think it's on, but I can uh, hear you. <laughs> good. Um, are you thinking, and, and how natural gas seems to have lower greenhouse gas emissions, are you thinking in terms of the ratio between natural gas grid, which has a lot of leaks, and we see methane, methane being seeped into the atmosphere at a higher rate than natural location? Um, natural location is a greenhouse gas emission. You hear me? OK. Um, yeah, I mean, the, what a, greenhouse gas emissions of uh, grids is not my specialty, but um, the, the data we use in the methodology in Portfolio Manager is uh, published greenhouse gas emissions factors for various grids, depending on their fuel mixes. I don't actually know the details of what's included in that calculation and how they uh, account for methane or not, but those are the greenhouse gas emissions factors as published by um, the various e-grids across the U.S. So, so my question is for Christian as well. Um, so Stephen Barbengartner from uh, Grow Happold a couple years, uh, four years ago, came and spoke on energy metrics. And one of the things he says, he did some work with the New York uh, database on their energy performance uh, that was going on in the city that had just been kind of released and they did some analysis. Um, and looking at alternate energy metrics, did you really consider economic output, especially for commercial buildings as a possible denominator to get at efficiency of these buildings? So you keep on talking about how, what we get out of these buildings and yet we don't have a denominator we're using to get to efficiency. We're you know, using EUI, which is intensity, and that's a great proxy for certain things. But do you think about some sort of denominators you would include to get to building performance from the other side? Economics could be social outcomes and so forth. And thinking about that in terms of alternate energy metrics for this, alternate, uh, for this pilot credit. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I can speak off from here. Sure. Uh, in the work we've done for some of the setting the EUI targets and greenhouse gas emissions targets for various policies, they have all been set uh, from an, both an outcome and economic perspective. So the way those targets tend to get set are to make sure that for various building types, they are achievable in a cost-effective way. And there's usually a life cycle cost analysis that says, you know, we can ask for this performance because we've done the legwork to know that for most buildings, it will be cost positive over its life cycle. Uh, and the reason we do that is because most projects don't have either the budgets or resources to do that economic analysis on their own, um, or they don't do as, as in depth. So we try and set the requirements with a lot of that legwork done and built into the energy targets. So um, your question is, you know, do, you, do you include a metric where the ec economics is sort of built into it and um, we haven't. It's an interesting question. I don't know how, how you would get that denominator, right? You'd have to do the work in, on individual projects to develop it. And, and I think the municipalities I've been involved with have done it the other way around, where they do all the legwork and pick a metric that they know is cost effective. And then project teams, you know, they'll, they'll find a way to meet it. And uh, there are cost effective options out there. But I, it's a valid point, And I, I haven't seen um, that type of uh, metric being used yet. Thanks. Uh, mine's uh, pretty much a thank you to Sarah Talkington. I'm Ted Tiffany. Um, for all your hard work on the TAG this year, developing a lot of these credits. Um, other TAG members in the room, I see Barry back there. Anyone else from EA TAG in the room? Um, these energy metrics that we're talking about are very, very confusing. Um, the market demand is, is very different. So we want to hear feedback from you. I'm sure Sarah would love to just talk your ear off about the different metrics about EUI and carbon. Um, but this is a very large challenge for uh, technical development and the EA TAG, especially what's important to you guys. Is it cost? Is it EUI? Is it carbon? Or is it a blend of all these things? So Sarah, I think I'm, it's a call to action for you guys to come and talk to us about those metrics today and how we can shape those. So, thank you, Sarah.
Good morning. Uh, my question is, uh, or yeah, it, I guess you can call it a question uh, for Sarah. Um, have you uh, looked into the implementation of uh, large scale liquid metal battery uh, to kind of offset that drop off in uh, photovoltaics or any sort of non rotational uh, energy generation to account for the, uh, the gaps? Yeah, right now our utility is participating in this uh, grant opportunity. It's called Shines. We're working with um, all sorts of the DOE. I think Tesla's involved. Uh, it's got some nice. utility scale uh, battery storage, and we're actually, actually uh, placing it pretty close on our grid to our community uh, solar farm. So um, it's happening now. It's pretty experimental. We're trying to convince some uh, projects to participate. Um, in the service territory, those houses with solar installed, some of our larger solar installations. So it's happening. It's very relevant. And, yeah, we can't wait to see how it turns out. Well, it, it's great to hear because I did a paper on liquid metal batteries back in college a few years ago. And that's one of the points yeah. that I was making is that to have that on-off um, yeah. zeros and ones effect uh, of, of energy production, that that would be a tremendous way to handle it. So that's yeah. great to hear that you're doing I guess I should have said there's like two things we need to work out, the wireless transmission of energy and the storage of energy. Those are well, uh, basically our two. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. My question as well is uh, for Sarah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the efficiency in the transmission, in the production and in, uh, transmission of the, of the grid in Houston? And what are the metrics that we should be looking for in the different parts of, you know, when we develop a project in the different parts of the world? I, I didn't hear the last part, sorry. So the no, efficiency what, what, of tra transmission? Right, right. then um, what, other, what metrics we should be looking at when we are looking into developing a project in a different parts of the world, you know, we, we should... Yeah, I think that's part of the reason why I'm so excited about PEER, <laughs> frankly, is it starts to uh, give us some normalization as opposed to me just knowing, like, I can write off uh, 25 to 30 percent of the energy that's generated because it's lost, and um, that's a ridiculous number in my estimation, um, but it's realities of um, what I understand to be what the wire skies are telling me. Um, but I'm, I'm not, uh, that's a hard uh, thing to hear because, uh, frankly, I think they have to be doing better and they're in uh, kind of some interesting parts of most utilities where they aren't focused too much on that. Like, they're all about reliability and all about making sure things are sized for those congestion peaks, but they aren't so concerned with the control and like conservation, voltage reduction, all of those things that I think um, we're all now asking them for. I don't think those conversations are at all mature, at least not in Texas. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone.